Today, we're going to take up from where we left off in the previous video and continue adding features to our Atari ST build. In that last video, I made an appeal for help to get hold of a copy of the manual for NeoDesk CLI. Joseph Keklowski came to the rescue for us and sent me a PDF of the CLI manual that he created. I've made that available on my old blog, and there's a link in the description to that. And thanks, Joe. That's brilliant. Now, in the gap between the last video and this video, I've frankly had a horrid time with my Atari ST. I was getting random crashes, fiddling with the boot order, getting different crashes. All in all, it was like a total hassle. Now I said this was going to be an evolving build, so to start with I'm going to have to roll back some stuff that I'd previously done and replace it. My biggest issue was that NVDI 2.5 and Speedo GDOS 5.7 were fighting each other, and to be honest I was the loser in that fight. The first one I'm going to install both of them and install NVDI 5. Now it's interesting that in modern computers your installer allows you to run install apps. In Atari installers on the whole they were good at installing the software and an installation is a, was a manual process. However, in this case, it was fairly easy. I removed both apps from the auto folder. Deleted the assign.sys and extend.sys files from the root of my C drive. Removed the NVDI and Speedo accessories from my ACK folder. Bin the control panel extensions for the two apps. And finally, I eviscerated the GemSys folder for the GDOS fonts and drivers. And I think that's enough synonyms for delete for now. Right, so let's get to installing NVDI 5. It's a simple next next process with some disk swapping and a few decisions to be made at the end, most of which I'm just going to fast forward through. We're using the built in graphics card, so we tell the installer that. Finally, we tell it where our CPX files are located. And I'm going to set the BT font location to be in the bin folder, just to keep my root drive clean. And here, NeoDesk's more powerful file dialog allows us to create a folder from within it, which is really nice. I've left GemSys in the root for now. I'll move that in. To clean up, I move the NVDI tools folder into our bin folder. And then a quick reboot later, I load the control panel extensions for fonts and caches and set the font path to point to the bin ET fonts folder. And then I reboot again. Finally, I'm going to remove the COPS accessory and W dialog from my auto folder as I'm using X control and W dialog does not work well under Geneva or at all, in fact. OK, I need to put the Geneva font back into the new NVDI so we get the looks we had at the end of the last episode. I edit the assign.sys to use the Geneva font, reboot, and we get more of what I was seeing previously, a random crash. So let's just ditch that Geneva font. I'm going to boot with the control key pressed to bypass all auto start items. Then we'll land in the default Emutos desktop where I'm going to remove the Geneva font and use NVDI's Monaco font in its place. I add the Monaco font at sizes 8, 9, 10, and 20. Post another reboot, we see well, it's similarly nice iconography for window decorations. I kind of missed the bold text on the drive letters, but it's I think it's a nice font. And some people were horrified by the letter I in the last font, so I think this is definitely cleaner. And when we get around to opening a CLI window in future videos, you'll see that the lower sized font in Monaco looks much better than it did in Geneva. So we have one final task to perform to complete the whole upgrade of NVDI and Speed or GDOS, and that's to move the GemSys folder into bin. To do this, we update the assign.sys file and drag the GemSys folder into boot. Yet another reboot later, and everything's good. Now I'm going to delete the old GemSys folder, and after cleaning backup files from the root, we're left with nine items in our C drive. Not bad. Now we can get to the nub of the video. Previously, I'd installed Papyrus 10, which is a word processor. I didn't really install it to use. I just wanted to install it to show a point. I'm not going to show the installation process because that's just drag and drop and really boring. So let's run it. It's going to ask me for substitute fonts for the PC variants, which is fair enough, because at least we can see the installation of NVDI 5 has worked. Although NVDI 5 only came with two fonts, so we'll have to find some more in a bit. So we do the substitutions, and, just, and as you can see, the app is fast as molasses. So I'm going to quit the app.
and what's this the st doesn't even have enough spare memory to quit and this is a four meg system okay i mean productivity is out the window for now but we do have two megs spare after papyrus crashes so let's play a game yeah so with geneva loaded we can't even play games either now we can reboot while pressing the control key not load any auto folder items and get us to the vanilla emutos desktop and we'll try that and see if it runs a game And of course it does. But can we do the same for Papyrus? And the answer is no. No auto folder means no NVDI. No NVDI means no fonts. And using the control key also means no accessories. And we really might want some of them when we're running a, a full screen gem app. So we need a solution that's less brute force than the control key, more nuanced if you like. And that solution is a boot manager. We're gonna install and configure xboot with configurations that fix my three primary use cases. I want a productivity desktop for day-to-day -day use, be able to run Papyrus without NeoDesk in Geneva, but with accessories loaded, and a bare bones system for gaming. Let's get started on that. Installing Xboot is a matter of dragging a single executable into the auto folder and rebooting. So this is what we see on first boot. Let's go over the interface. We can ignore the warning about no sets for now because we're going to create one in a second. The UI is split into five main sections. To the left is the list of programs in our auto folder. Next, the list of available accessories, which is empty at the moment. The list of CPX files that are available that are also empty at the moment. And underneath that is a assign.sys and a new desk.inf. Then there's the list of available sets and at the far right, a toolbar. Now the accessory and CPX lists are empty and that's because we're using non-standard locations for those files. And we'll fix that in the settings in a second. Sets, which are the meat and potato of Xboot, are collections of enabled auto programs, accessories and control panel extensions, as well as an associated assign.sys and new desk.inf. So let's take a quick tour of that toolbar. The undo button reverts all changes since the last save. The new set button allows you to create a new set. The I button gives information on the currently selected set. The trash can deletes the current set. The batch button allows you to specify a script of commands to execute for the set. And, and that's, a, that's a, like a power level feature that's beyond the scope of this video. System info allows you to set the current date and time if you don't have a real time clock. The toolbox icon gives access to a number of utilities. Question mark gives help. Save button saves all sets, and the final button quits Xboot and boots the current set. So let's create a set. I'm going to call this one Productivity. Now in this set, I want to add all auto folder apps, accessories, and CPXs. So this is the same as what we started with at the beginning of this video. So this is going to form my daily driver. So we can fix that lack of accessory and CPX files by telling Xboot where they are located. Now we need to turn on the ones we want to load. And in this case, it's all accessories and the usual suspect of CPX files. A tick next to an item shows it's enabled in this set. Now we click the button and boot into our productivity set. and Everything is working as before. I'm going to reboot and go back into Xboot. Now you can see here that when Xboot loads, there is now a countdown bar. If that countdown bar reaches zero, then the last set you used will be booted automatically. If you move the mouse or hit a key, the auto boot will be cancelled and the countdown stopped. It's worth knowing that hitting control Q during the countdown will boot straight into your last set. So that's your quickest way of getting things booted. So I'm just going to go into the tools section and change the load order to put X boot first. So you can drag and drop your applications and set the order you want them to execute. But X boot should be the very first thing. Otherwise, you can't control what boots after it. I do a quick reboot to test that. I'll skip showing that. I mean, there's going to, there are a lot of reboots in this. I do apologize. So now I'm going to create my set for Papyrus. I'm taking Geneva and NeoDesk out of the mix. I'm disabling the task manager accessory because that is Geneva specific. I save the set and I boot it. Okay, notice we have no accessories here. And that's because it was Geneva that knew where to look for accessories in the bin slash ack folder. And we need a mechanism to get plain old emu toss to do the same. 
So there's an auto program called ACK.PRG that will load accessories from a folder in the root drive named ACCS or ACKS. So I'm going to drag that PRG into the auto folder and I'm going to move my ACK folder from bin onto the C drive and rename it to ACKS. Finally, back in Xboot, we need to tell it where the new location of the accessories are. Now, notice for productivity that the ACK program is off. We'll fix Geneva in a bit. We don't want to use the ACK program because it doesn't work with Geneva. But for Papyrus, we're going to turn it on. So if we boot into the Papyrus set, we get accessories. Papyrus runs and NVDI is present, which is the most important thing. But looking at sys sysinfo, there's almost all of the four megabyte available to the desktop. So job done for Papyrus. Let's fix Geneva. Booting into our productivity set. We see no accessories, as you expect. We're going to go to the gem conf file and set the ACK path to the new location. And then post another reboot, everything is now working. So we're 100% working on productivity and on Papyrus. Let's get our games working. So booting into color mode, we see a very, very red X boot. Why oh, he chose that color? Let's create a set called games. Apart from X boot, I don't want anything else hogging memory. So we're just going to disable everything. I'm going to boot into that profile and see if Jet Set Willy runs. And it does. So we've achieved our goal of having the three configurations for our most frequent use cases. Xboot does more than what we've covered here, but and now it's sufficient. As our build proceeds, if we need them, we'll use more features of Xboot, and I'll explain them as we go. But that's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I'll talk to you soon.